Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacy Joyce and I will be your host. If you have questions and you're joining us live, remember that you can ask them anytime throughout the webinar. Just find yourself to the, uh, the chat button in the top left corner of the screen and change the to field so it includes attendees. That way everyone who's joining us live will be able to see what questions are being asked by other viewers. Today's guest is Dr. Allison Duncan. She is a professor in the Department of Human Health and Nutritional Sciences at the University of Guelph. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Duncan. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacey. It's really great to be here, everybody. I'm just getting my slides up to get started on our presentation. So I'm really glad that everyone can join us here today, and I'm excited to speak to you about functional foods for health. And so what I'm going to do in our presentation is give you a bit of background about food, nutrition, and health, and then talk a little bit about functional foods and give you some examples of research that I do at University of Guelph around functional foods and health, and talk a little bit about communicating that research. Before we get started, I just want you to know that it's really, um, relevant to all this that I love my job. Everything I do in my job I really love and it's a really important aspect of my job and so I'm hopeful that all of you through your education will find something that you love and that you can get a job around that. So today we're going to be talking about food, nutrition and health and everyone can relate to food. Probably all of you hopefully have had breakfast this morning and you might have even had a snack so far. And you're probably going to have more snacks or lunch and dinner. And there's things that go into how you decide what to eat, eat each day. How do you decide what to eat? Well, we know what you eat can affect your health. And the relationship between food, nutrition, and health is very well known. In fact, that relationship between food and health drives much activity around the food industry, research funding, health professionals, and consumers. And when we think about health, there's many different things you might think about. What is health? Does it mean you don't have a disease? Does it mean you have mental health and physical health? Is it amount, how long you live? Is it the quality of how you live? There's many aspects of health. And we know that we can manage our health through many things. And what we're gonna be talking about today is nutrition. But it's just, not just nutrition, it's also physical activity, stress, your attitude, how much sleep you get, and even sometimes pharmaceuticals or drugs are used to manage health. Well, we know that we can manage our health by nutrition, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And traditionally, when we think about managing our health through nutrition, we've come up with numbers for nutrients that we need to prevent deficiencies. So you may have heard of scurvy, a vitamin C deficiency. And we've come up with numbers that are for all of Canada so that we don't get scurvy. Now, we know a lot about these deficiencies, and over time, we've decided that we're actually going to optimize our health, not just prevent scurvy, but we're going to consider nutrition in a way to reduce risk of disease down the road. That is long-term goals versus short-term goals. And we have something called dietary reference intakes. It's a Health Canada guideline for different nutrient intakes, and now it's considering this chronic long-term health. Well, getting back to nutrition and thinking about that long-term health, we know that we're choosing our foods every day and everywhere. And everyone knows things about nutrition and food choices. And we really have a lot of opportunity for, to make good decisions for ourselves. And there's a lot of tools that guide us. Just our common sense. We probably know it's probably not a good idea to have a chocolate bar for breakfast. We just have this common sense about what's healthy to eat. But we also have Canada's Food Guide to Healthy Eating, we have different logos that are on packages, and we have functional foods. So Canada's Food Guide to Healthy Eating, just a quick shout out that you're probably aware of this, your teachers may have shown to you or your parents, and this is a guideline by Health Canada that gives us guides on what to choose to eat at different meals and snacks. Now it's really interesting that Health Canada is revising this food guide and it's going to be coming out with a new one in the coming year and that should be really interesting to keep track of. I also mentioned these logos on packages. You know when you see a food package there's so much information on it. Not only what, the what it actually is, 
but there's a list of ingredients, there's a fact about the nutrition, and all of this has really caused a lot of information for us. So what has happened is companies have come up with logos, which are just a way to summarize all that information. So we know about the blue menu. One that's really that I've been involved with from a scientific perspective is guiding stars. That's in all the Loblaw law related stores that give us an indication of um, higher nutritional quality of food. And now getting to the topic of the morning is this functional foods. This idea of functional foods has really revolutionized our approach to how to eat healthy. We're really looking at foods from more than just nutrients to provide basic nutrition, but to give us an indication of reducing chronic disease. So, the simplest definition is that these foods could provide health benefits beyond that basic nutrition. So they're just a food, but they have something in the food, whether that's fiber or omega-3 fatty acids or probiotics, something that's been enhanced in the food and added to the food and can help improve our health. So food and health. This is quite a long definition that Health Canada has put forward and we don't really need to read the whole definition. I'm going to simplify it, but just looking at the bottom, we see eggs with omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are a special bioactive ingredient that's been shown to improve health. We see a base cell with plant sterols. We see a milk with omega-3 fatty acids. And we see a cereal with psyllium fiber. So we see a food can become a functional food if you add things, concentrate things, even remove things that are unhealthy or modify things. And so foods can become functional foods. And these functional foods, so to speak, can really improve our health long term. I'm going to give you some quick examples of research studies that I'm involved in at the University of Guelph that look at these foods and try and examine whether they, in fact, do affect our health in a good way. The first project that I was involved in that I'm going to share is about soybeans. So now you probably know about soybeans. Depending where you live in Canada and Ontario, you drive by soybeans every day. And so soybeans are growing in the field and they have a lot of um, qualities that can contribute to our health. One of them is a plant chemical called isoflavone. What we did in this project is we collaborated with people that grow soybeans. And they grew those soybeans. You can see um, the picture of us in the top left-hand corner of growing the soybeans. And we grew these soybeans with different amounts of this phytochemical, a plant chemical called isoflavones. These isoflavones actually help the soybeans to survive. They've been shown to help us to reduce our risk of disease. So we took these soybean plants. It had a low, a medium, a high amount of isoflavones. And we made soy protein powder and soy flowers. And then we created a bread. We then in phase three did some studies to see if people eat this bread, can they absorb those isoflavones? Can we actually measure those isoflavones in their body? And we also saw, do they like the bread? Um, what would be the benefits of including this bread in the marketplace? So this is an example of quite a large project that I was involved in that looked at this soy bread, a functional food that was, had different amounts of isoflavones. Another project I'm actively involved in right now is focused on lentils. So I know some of you are with us from Western Canada. You'll be probably more familiar with lentils because lentils grow in Western Canada, especially a lot in Saskatchewan. And there's a lot of nutritional attributes of lentils. Lentils are a type of pulse. So pulses are not only lentils, but beans, peas, and chickpeas. And I'm not sure if you've tasted lentils before, but I definitely recommend tonight you ask your parents to buy some lentils and have them right away because they are so tasty and they have all these amazing nutritional attributes. They're not only amazing nutritionally, but they're actually part of Canada's food guide. They're part of the United States dietary guidelines. So they're nationally recognized for their nutrition. So what we did in our love of lentil study, and if you'll notice, that's LOL. So I think you guys can relate to that acronym, but it's love of lentils this time, is we looked to see if people ate these lentils with or without white rice, would it improve their blood glucose? So blood glucose is something that we all have. It's in all of our blood all the time. 
but we can manage it better sometimes if we eat the right foods. So what we said is if you just eat white rice, it's not going to be as good for your blood glucose as if you combine lentils with it. So this is a one graph I'm going to show you. And graphs are something you may not have taken in school yet, but if not, you will be very soon. And graphs have different axes. So it's like the line going upwards is blood glucose, and the line going across is the two treatments. So we have L2R, which is lentils plus rice, and we have rice. And as I mentioned, blood glucose, we all have it, so it's never gonna be zero, but we do wanna keep it lower. So you can see the lentil, the black bar, is lower than the gray bar. This is showing that when we combine the lentils with the rice, it lowered that glucose, and that's a good thing. So the love of lentils is telling us we should love them, not only because they're tasty and nutritionally packed, but they can lower our blood glucose, and this can help our diabetes risk. Another study I was involved with with diabetes is all about bagels. So this study, we called it the Better Bagel Study. I'm sure some of you had bagels for breakfast or snacks, and bagels can differ in terms of how nutritious they are. What we did with this bagel study is we collaborated with some plant agriculture scientists who grew a corn or a maize that was high in a certain fiber called resistant starch. Resistant starch is an interesting fiber. It can really help us to improve our risk of diabetes and colon cancer. And so you know what we did? We collaborated with Canada Bread. They're the same company that make the bagels for Tim Hortons. So right after they made the Tim Horton bagels, we got in there and made our bagels. It was three in the morning because they had to get all those Tim Horton bagels made first, but we finally got in there and made our bagels. And we did a big human study we called the Better Bagel Study. And we showed that if you ate these bagels that had this active ingredient, resistant starch, it was better for your risk of diabetes and colon cancer. So that was the Better Bagel Study. Then I've also been involved in a study about tea. So spearmint tea for arthritis. We call this Project Mint Tea. This is another study that was involved starting with agriculture. You know, everything starts with agriculture. It's a great thing to be aware of and tons of careers in that area. And agriculture can really improve our health when we look at it from different perspectives. This time we looked at a spearmint tea plant that had high amounts of something called rosmineric acid. This is a really interesting compound, this rosmineric acid. We just call it RA. It's been shown to improve health in different aspects. And you know what? It actually helped horses. Horses just ate up the plant. They didn't drink a tea. They just ate it all up, and it helped their joints. They could race better. They were faster. So we thought, you know what? We're going to make a tea and feed it to humans and see if their osteoarthritis, their arthritis pain, would improve. Here's another graph for you. So as we mentioned, the graphs have these axes. Up the top is the distance. How far could the humans walk on this test where we just walked them for six minutes to see how far they could walk? Across the bottom is when they had the tea for zero weeks, eight weeks, and 16 weeks. Every day they drank the tea. They had the green RA tea, or they had the black control tea. And you can see at the end, the green dot's a lot higher than the black dot. It showed that drinking that tea for 16 weeks helped them to perform better on this test. And we looked at many other things. And overall, we showed that this spearmint tea was helping people for osteoarthritis. This tea is an example of a functional food. And helping arthritis is an example of improving health. So it's all well and good to do all of this research about functional foods. But do people even understand what functional foods are? This is a study we did in 200 older adults where we looked at, do they even consume functional foods? Well, we found that of the 200 adults, 26% of them, so a quarter around, that would be 25%, were aware of the term. But once they were kind of asked a little bit more, 93%, almost 100%, were consuming functional foods. And most of them were consuming it at breakfast. You'll see here this pie chart, now I'm a dietitian, so you think that I might not like pie charts, but I do, and I like pie too. And you can see in this pie chart, it shows most of it was at breakfast that they were consuming the functional foods. 
Here we see the most common functional foods. So here's some examples. We see those omega-3 eggs again. Here's yogurt with probiotics, bread with fiber, cereal with fiber, orange juice with calcium and vitamin D. So it's interesting to do all this research and see that people do want to are interested in functional foods. But one of the things that's really important, and I think all of you can get creative about this, is communicating research. It's really a key part of the research process. That is taking the knowledge that you create in research, translating it, making it a way that someone can understand, and transferring it to those people. You guys have a lot of creativity and a lot to offer to figure out how we can best do this. Here's some of the ways that I've done it in my job. I've created postcards, created toolkits, and even created a recipe resource. Here's a postcard that we created that showcases functional food bioactives. So bioactives, they're those ingredients in the functional foods. What are they? How can they contribute to healthy aging? And where can you find them? So here's an omega-3 fatty acid. We can get those naturally in a lot of fatty fish, but we can also get them in functional foods. So we just created these postcards, really easy go-to resources for people to understand what functional foods are. All of these resources I'm sharing with you are available free for download. And you can see um, it's through Agri-Food for Healthy Aging. You can just Google it as well and get them all free for download. This is a toolkit that I created. A toolkit is just a fancy word for a resource with all the information together. I put together with my graduate students an information kit for dietitians to help them to better understand functional foods. One of the things we did in this kit that I thought you'd be interested in is we took um, packages of common foods. So there you see Cheerios. When we look at a box of Cheerios, there's so much information on it. If you're eating Cheerios for breakfast, ask your parents if you can look at the box. There's labels all over the place. What do these labels mean? What are they telling us? And so we made, we took stock of all of that information and made little notes for the dietitians to better understand this. The final resource I'm going to share with you is the recipe resource that we put together. That's kind of a fancy word for a cookbook, but we made it more resourceful. We really wanted to showcase, highlight, how is it that agriculture, food, and healthy aging can come together? And we focused on older adults to help them to age optimally and have a healthy aging experience. So we filled this resource with recipes. We made mention of farm facts, nutrition facts, cooking tips and testimonials, and we made it free to everybody. Even you can download it too. Here's some examples of some recipes that we did. We collaborated with the Ontario Beekeepers Association, the Ontario Goat Cheese Organization, and we put these, um, got these recipes from them and we called out things we called out things about nutrition and healthy aging. We called out things about what are in things. What is it in beef that helps us to be healthy? What about eggs and blueberries and asparagus? And we made mention of all these things relating agriculture, food, and human health. Some more recipes here. All these recipes are catered for older adults to be simple, easy to read, large font, and they can make them. You can make them too. Everyone can. And you can download a copy of the recipe resource. So just to summarize, functional foods are one of many tools that can be used to promote healthy eating. It's up to you to eat healthy, and you've got lots of tools to help you. There's many examples of functional foods that are being examined in research and how they can help us to age the best way that we can. And there's a huge opportunity to take all that research and information and create resources, tools for people to understand it, to increase the value of all that knowledge. So here's all of the organizations that provide support for what I'm doing. And I work with a lot of amazing students at University of Wealth. And I feel like I'm still a student. I'm a lifelong learner. And I can tell you right now, I'm going to learn a lot from all the questions that you ask me. I've already learned so much from interacting with Stacey and with this organization. And now we're going to move on to some questions from you guys. And I want you to ask me any question at all. Okay, thanks, Stacey. Well, thank you so much. Before you actually stop, oh, I'll get you to share your screen again. I couldn't say that fast enough, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we have a quick question about where uh, our audience can get those recipes. Was that a downloadable resource as well? It sure was. So you can go to Agri-Food for Healthy Aging. 
And so, okay, so they can just Google the AgriFood. Yeah, so here's the logo down here for AgriFood for Healthy Aging. Perfect. I'm just going to write that in the chat for anyone who's with us live. Um, <clears throat> and then they can follow up as well a little bit later. Now, the reason I really wanted your slides up was because we had a couple questions about the T research, and I know that you had a handy graph there. And the first question I wanted to ask was, um, what was the control T all about? So obviously you were giving one group um, the T that you were hoping might have an effect, and you did see that effect. We see that those who had the T, that line is going up, they were able to walk farther after having, uh, you know, a couple weeks of that T every day. But what is the control line all about? Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, as all of you learn more about science, you'll learn that we always need to have a control group. And a control group is a group that is participating in the experiment, but they're not getting the accurate treatment. So here, we had two groups of people that had arthritis. One was having the rose A, the green line, and the other was having a control T, which was just a spearmint T, but without the, that bioactive ingredient. And so it shows us that there was no, the control T didn't really affect the walking. It wasn't until it had the rose in it. So that's what the control is. There's always some kind of control group. And do you think that the results would have been different if they just didn't have tea? Why give them tea at all? That's a really good question. I think whoever is asking this question is going to be a scientist. Because what that means is that there could be something called a placebo effect, which is you think that you're on the treatment, so you um, do better. So you, you have to, in a scientific ex experiment, have both groups getting some kind of treatment. So like in a drug study, for example, someone would get the drug and someone would get something called a placebo or just a pill with nothing in it. Wonderful. So um, I'm just one, I'm looking for the T questions we had. We had a couple more here. Um, we have Ms. Theobald's class asking, how much tea would you have to drink to feel its impact? That's a really good question. So these people were having two cups of tea per day. So not a lot. Um. Wonderful. And we had a few questions about the, um, the soy bread study, but I don't think we need this, the slides anymore for our other questions here. Um, so we have the grade five and six class at uh, Denlo Public School wondering if the consumers were told that they were eating soy bread or did they think they were just eating regular bread? Okay, this is again a really good question. So again, what we did in that study is we had a control group. And so they um, either ate the bread with the soy or the bread without, and no one knew which, which was which. And that's something called blinding. Blinding in a scientific study increases its quality. Because if you knew or the people in the study knew, then there might be some influence on what you're looking at. You want it to be completely objective. So we definitely had a bread that looked exactly like the soy bread, and that was the control bread. Again, the control every time. Um, okay, so we had another question about the soybean or soy bread project. Uh, Ms. Gouet's class at St. Augustine is wondering how long did that research project take? Well, you know what? Research takes a long time. So it's a definite process. So that project was actually a four-year project. But we learned so much in that project and so many students were trained and now have amazing jobs. And so it's not just about doing that one study. It's about training students and then they go on to have amazing jobs and it's about doing other things as well. So there's lots going on in research. Right. And uh, we have a couple questions from the grade threes at Armour Heights Public School that were unable to join us live, but they're going to watch this video tomorrow for their, their answers. Um, we have a question from Alex wondering, can fruit ever be bad for you? And Mackenzie is wondering if you can ever eat too much fruit. These are really good questions. And one thing I want to say up front is that the words good, bad, aren't exactly the best words to use around food and eating. So all foods can be part of a healthy diet. It's a matter of how much you eat. 
Now, when it comes to fruit and vegetables, I don't think you can eat too many fruits and vegetables. I think that probably you would just start to get sick of it. I really don't think you're at risk of eating too much fruits or vegetables. So that's just not an excuse you can use. <laughs> so I eat too much fruit. And what was the next question again? Uh, so one was, can fruit ever be bad for you? And the other was, can you ever eat too much fruit? So no and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, Kia from the, the same grade three class at Armour Heights is wondering uh, if fruits that are manufactured by humans, meaning um, like man-made hybrids and things like that, are they bad for you? Okay. So that's a really good question, Kia. And I think that the answer is no. So there's a lot of innovation that's going on in our food industry, and we are so lucky to have that innovation. We're so lucky that we can do things like this and not worry about getting um, problems from our food. Our food is safe, and Health Canada makes sure of that. Great. And now I want to go to a question from Ms. McClinton's class. They're wondering if the... Actually, we have Manilaos uh, at North Asian Court wondering if... Um, the labels on packaging are good or bad. So again, this good or bad question, is it actually an answer in the middle? Yes, so that's a really good question to ask about the labels. And it's hard to figure out on the labels because there's so much information. We could talk so long about labels, but what you want to do is look at the labels and probably the easiest thing you want to look at is the percent daily value, percent DV. And so that's giving you an idea and you don't want it to be like, super high for the nutrients that maybe you want to limit and then vice versa. So the good and bad question, it's, it's hard to answer that. It really depends. Um, but sometimes you do want to limit things. So you don't want to have like too, too much sodium or saturated fat, and you want to make sure that you are getting dietary fiber. So it all comes back though to common sense. What I mentioned before, you probably know if this is a healthier choice or not, you probably know. You can just ask yourself and you can figure it out. So now we have uh, a question from, um, I have to pick here. We've got lots of questions. That's wonderful. Uh, another question from Ms. McClinton's class. They're uh, wondering how do probiotics work? That's such a good question and such an interesting story. So probiotics are actually live bacteria. They're live bacteria. And it's really interesting that when we consider our body and the, you know, when we put food in our mouth, it goes through our intestine, to our large intestine, and then we poo it out. Our poo can actually tell us a lot about our body. Probiotics are bacteria that make it all the way into our large intestine. These bacteria, probiotics are bacteria, they help us to be healthier. In our large intestine where the poo is, is being formed, that is going to help us to have better bacteria and it's shown to improve our health. So if you really want to know about your health, collect your poo samples and get it analyzed for bacteria. And we actually featured another University of Guelph professor about a year ago, I think it was last January, who does that, who studies poo essentially and all of the bacteria in, uh, in the colon. And I know so I want... Her name is Emma. Yes, Emma Allen Verco, that's right. Um, so if anyone's interested in learning more about that, you can find the recording of her webinar on the YouTube channel. Um, I've worked with Emma on many projects. Collaboration, do you collaborate much in your research? All the time. Yeah, collaboration, working I together. Think Wonderful. Now, um, we have a question from Ms. Kaibel Sarovi's class, wondering if the tea helps with anything else other than the arthritis, and how do you come up with studying bagels? Maybe in general, where do the ideas for your research studies come from? So in terms of the tea, it, because it helps inflammation, it could help other areas besides arthritis. So it could help any disease that had a relation to inflammation. In terms of how we came up with bagels, how do you even come up with all these ideas? That's actually a key part of research. It's figuring out, well, what do we need to know? Where are the gaps? What are the questions? In your classes every day, you can be thinking about that. You're learning so much information, but you can also question things about that information. And that comes from the word why. So why 
is how we come up with these ideas. So never stop asking why. Wonderful. So we're, we're a little over time already. I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions here. Um, the first one we've received from a couple different classes about foods that seem to have uh, an ingredient we consider good um, and ingredients that we consider maybe not as healthy for us. So um, Ms. Davies' class is wondering if you eat a strawberry, good for us, covered in chocolate, maybe not as good for us. Uh, does it take away from the health benefits of the strawberry? Absolutely not, because you're still eating the strawberry. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend you have your strawberries coated in chocolate every single day. But in terms of a dessert option, that's a great option because you get the nutrients from the strawberry while you're getting the chocolate. And, uh, and the last question I have is more of a general question for you. Um, we had a few questions coming in from the students about how long have you been teaching or how long did it take you to become a dietitian? So I thought maybe what would be good to finish off today is to ask you a bit about your path. You know, as a child, did you always say, I'm going to be a dietitian? Or um, did you have a bit of a zigzagging path to get where you are today? What did that look like? Well, I can share my path, but first day that no matter what, zigzagging is very common. And I see many people that aren't even sure what they want to do right now when they're in university and they end up doing amazing. For me, I knew that I wanted to be a dietitian for quite a long time since early in high school. I was a runner when I was growing up and a soccer player. And I quickly learned that the food that I eat affects what, how I perform in sport. And so I found out about this career dietitian thing and my dad looked into it for me and found out about 12. And so that's how I found out about it. Um, and I've always loved nutrition, but it's really, um, the world, there's so much opportunity for different jobs. So it's just really thinking about what you love and you're going to figure it out and you're going to talk to people around you and, and get help from people and talk to your teachers and your friends and your parents, and you'll figure out how to have an amazing job that you love. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Duncan. I think our students learned a lot and, and definitely benefited from your, your passion for the subject and conveying the knowledge that you have. So thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks, everybody. And uh, next week on PIR live event, we are discussing energy sources like solar and wind and nuclear and, and how to evaluate um, maybe which one is better than another one in different scenarios and, uh, and all those details. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can join us next week and you can find more information about that webinar and the other educational programs offered by Partners in Research Canada at PIRweb.org. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone who's here live today, and I hope you have a great day. Bye now.